Let's pray as we begin. Father, this morning as we get started, we thank you yet again for being with us, for guiding us, and even more, for showing us the way. Father, right now as we take a look at this fourth part in the series and the whole concept of having it all, we ask that you would help us to more fully understand that in the times that we think that we have it all, we've probably lost it all. Guide us as we struggle together, as we look through this concept, and even more as we grow together in you. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, it's interesting. So often we hear this statement, or you could call it a question, it seems to be a question at times, where people ask or they're pondering, you know, if only I had dot, dot, dot. You know, maybe it's something that that you personally have thought about. Where you look at someone else's, whether it's another person's apartment, their car, their schooling, their bank account. And the only thing that seems to come through our mind is, if only I had that. But we don't just stop right there. If only I had that, then I would be happier. Now, so often when we look at that, when we're going down that thought process, we're not getting happier, we're getting more depressed. Because when we get to that level, all of a sudden we realize that someone else has more than we do. And the more that we get, the more that we have to have, and the less content we end up being. You know, in this, God tells us that it's not about what you have, but it's about the connection that you have with Him. Where in having it all means you don't have to have it all in this earth. But having a relationship with Him is about having it all. But at the same time, we have to understand that we can't be sitting on that proverbial fence. You know, too often we say that, well, you know, we're sitting on the fence because we're deciding on whether or not what we're going to really do. But we forget that in sitting on this fence, we end up with the proverbial thorns or the proverbial splinters, if you want to call them that, that end up, end up hurting us in the long run and doing more damage to us than if we had been on the other side. Where God continues to tell us, hey, there's only one true side, and that's with me. If you want to truly have it all, Truly having it all means having a relationship with me. But even more than just that, come, follow me. Let me make you into the person that I continue to call you to be. You know, from Genesis to Revelation, we continue to see this theme coming out time and time and time again. But it didn't matter what was going on, Jesus continued to call people back to this. You know, today we've got an area that's very important, not just because of the order that it's in within the Bible itself, but it's important because of the times that we're living in. Because so many people, because of the scarcity of things, we're starting to get to that point once again where we're thinking, well, you know, if only I had whatever, then I would be even happier than the situation I'm in right now. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, but we'll be looking at verses 13 to 21. In this, this is a very important, very vital point in Scripture because Jesus is trying to get the people of not only that day, but ultimately the people of our day to understand what's truly important in that what we're focusing on happens to be the wrong thing. So let's take a look at this together. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13, says this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now right there, you can say brother, you can say sister, you can say extended family. There's a, a lot of room in this that we can look at this. When it comes to relatives that have died, this is one of the stickiest subjects 
that you'll ever have to handle. Because depending on what the person has will depend on how many quote-unquote relatives there actually come out of the woodwork. But right here we see a situation come up where this person is saying, hey Jesus, do what's right and actually tell my relative to get off their rear and actually be following the, following the law of God. Now, obviously we don't do that, we're not like that, or, or are we? You know, so often, as we take a look at even the times that we're living in, people would rather go after someone's possessions after they died than to actually appreciate the person for who they were when they were actually alive. Now that's, that's a subject for a totally different time, but that's something that I want you to think about momentarily because too often as we take a look at our own families, we forget about the here and now and the person as they are now, and then when they're dead, all of a sudden their possessions become something more. But we see, we see this right here. But here's the, the problem with this is it wasn't just something that all of a sudden came up. During these times, especially because of the Roman oppression, this was the, the thing to focus on. Where they had to have something, they had to have some type of inheritance in order to go, go forward. Especially if the relatives happened to be close in age. They were allotted a specific portion and a lot of times, if they didn't get that immediately, the Romans would come in and they'd take it all. <laughs> Just thinking about that, obviously, we don't have that problem today, do we? Because our government doesn't work that way. Or does it? Verse 14. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Right there yet again, as we've taken a look in the previous three, three, three sermons in our series so far, when a situation comes up, most of the time, instead of answering it with a specific answer, Jesus throws out a question. Specifically, we could translate it like this. Jesus looks at the man and says, Who do you think I am? Do you really think that I have come to be over either one of you to pronounce judgment. Now, right there, as we're inserting ourselves in the story, we could say yes. You know, yes, you've come to do this. However, we need to understand the times as the people were seeing Jesus, they weren't seeing him as a lamb that was coming to the slaughter. They saw him as a lion ready to conquer. But even more, to specifically conquer the parasites that were wrong. And so this is what they're trying to egg Jesus on so that when it comes down to it, they'll get what they want. But we forget to see that every time they do this, instead of getting what they want, they always got what they needed, which was not what they had bargained for. But so Jesus throws out this question. And then comes in to verse 15. Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Right there, we need to remember this. That when Jesus came into a situation, even before he came into the situation, Jesus read the heart and the mind. He knew what was truly going on, and he saw the intentions of this person. And it was truly intentions of covetousness. At the base of his heart, he wanted everything, and nothing would satisfy him if he did not have it all. Basically trying to take any relative out of the picture that would have anything to say when it came to this. But Jesus comes and he answers 
his own question with a statement. Basically, let's put it into modern English. Jesus is telling us this. He's saying, hey, listen, what you think you want is not what you really need. You're focusing on the here and now and on all this stuff, but when it comes down to it, you're going to be eternally lost because you focused on the wrong thing. Take your mind, take your eyes out of the prize that you think of what is and focus on me. Because in focusing on me, the eternal treasure will never cease because it's a part of who I am. And even more than just that, we can continue to add this, that every time Jesus finished this, even though it's not written, he continues to say this. He makes a statement and then he follows up that statement with follow me. Because every time that Jesus is making a plea, every time he's telling a parable or retelling a parable as it was, he continues to call out to them that this is what your paradigm is right now, but this is not what I want you to be at. Where I want you to be at is right beside me. Continue to follow me, and that's where you will have everything, because it's not about this life. But he goes on. Verse 16, And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. Right there, in the start of a retelling of a very well-known well parable, he plucks this rich person out of obscurity, and puts him on a piece of land. Right there, as the Jewish mind was contemplating this, the moment that Jesus said that it was very productive, they their minds went wild. Because in this, what they pictured was the very fact that God had blessed beyond measure. They believed that, number one, if you had a lot of money, God has blessed you. If you have a big family, God has blessed you even more. But the pinnacle of knowledge of knowing that God has blessed you is if, you're a, if your land doesn't just produce, it has an abundance of an abundance. And that's what we see right here. And these guys are getting really excited. Are probably on the edge of where they're sitting on the grass, Going, okay, we know the end of the story. We know what, where Jesus is going. Come on. Lay it on us. Bring it to us. Show us what you actually have. And he continues on. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. Right there, they're getting even more excited because Jesus is showing them the pinnacle of what it means to follow God, or at least what they thought it meant to follow God. But really, they had lost in their own translation what things actually meant. Man, instead of thinking upon God, he's thinking upon himself. Which, when we're looking at this, we can look at it this way. Someone just coined a new word for me about a week ago. How, how it, is it that you can be a Christian yet focus on yourself? Let's take a look at the root. Really, you're focused on selfianity. You are at the center of your own religion. And that's what this man was. He was focusing so much on himself. God is out of the picture, but not only is God out of the picture, but everyone else is. When he specifically says, number one, and please understand that this is in the underlying tone of the text, Number one, God has given, but I don't have to give back. Number two, even though God has given to me, I don't have to give back to others. And number three, 
is it's all about me. And we see this where he says, okay, my barns are too small, my silos, everything is too small for this extreme abundance. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear everything down and I'm going to make it to even better than what it was before. Because when it comes to the end, it's all about me, it's all about what I want, and it's all about what I get. Because God's the one serving me. Maybe we need to stop there. Did you catch that? God's about serving me? That's our problem today, is that when we take a look at what God has blessed us with, God is not serving us. We're the ones serving him, and he gives us abundance to go and share with others so that we're able to bless others with what God has given us. The moment that we get into the point where we think that God serves us or that God must give us stuff is the moment that we've sunk into Satan's trap and the moment that we start serving selfianity because we think it's all about us. You could have the whole world, but you've lost yourself because that's all that you're focused on. However, you can push the whole world aside, focus on Jesus and Jesus alone, and the doors of eternity are open to us. Because when we focus on Jesus and we allow him to fully change our hearts and our minds and our lives, all of a sudden we see that because we believe, that automatically goes into wanting to help others because of the life that was changed. So, he's wanting to build bigger barns. Verse 19, get this. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Seems to be the theme of our, our times now. Where we go, oh, I have it all. I have nothing to worry about. I don't need to give back because others should be giving to me. When through all the scriptures... God continues to tell us, I have given to you so that you can give to others. Trust with what I've given you that you're going to go and give it back. Don't continue to steal what God has given to keep for yourself and not return to him or to give back to others. But he goes one step further than just this. He goes, okay, this is mine. I have set myself up for a very nice life. And now what I can do is I can party to the end of the age and then some. Now, obviously, this is not a problem for us as a church because that's something that is the thought process of outside. Or is it? In the very text, when Jesus is talking about this person, he's not talking about someone from the world. He's talking about someone that has been so richly blessed by God that they take it for themselves. But within that same paradigm, I want us to take two steps back and remember this, that every time something is given whether the person is within the Christian church, did you hear that? Within the Christian church, or they are a person that's in the world, God's blessings fall on the people that are in the church as well as those that are unchurched. To say that it's only given to us is where a problem is. And we have to be very careful because God's word has other things to say about that. Church leader, very well off, but he decides to focus on, on himself. 
Now let's take a look at this. Verse 20. Here's where the story starts getting very interesting. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Right there, we could translate it as this. God specifically saying, oh man, man, what have you done to yourself? How you have focused so much on yourself that you've lost sight of me. Now here's what's going to happen. Tonight, this very night, I'm calling for your life. You are going to die. And guess what? There will not be a single person that's going to be deeded your stuff. Now that seems pretty harsh, doesn't it? But it's true. And that's something we need to understand. Is that when we come between God and what he has asked, asked for us to do, there will come a point where he will say enough is enough. And he'll call for our lives. Now, when it says, especially right here, that he calls for the man's life, the whole connotation in there is not within the second death. It is basically saying, your time for this part on earth is done. Your story is closed. And next is the judgments. But we're given almost a small glimpse in this of that there's some mercy still given to this man. Where God basically says, like I said, I'm calling for your life right now, but not for eternity. Now, if our lives were called at this moment in time, would God give that kind of grace to us? Where he's saying, okay, you have stood in front of my work too long, and you will be rolled over, and I will call your life as, as a consequence of what you have done. But it will not be of the second death. Would he tell us that? Or would he say this? You have been in my way too long, and because you have not followed me, I'm calling for your, your life and your existence altogether. Too often when it comes to this, because we have put ourselves first and others at the very rear end of our schedules, and because we focused on the items instead of the one that actually created the items, that's what God is actually calling now. He wants us to remember that it's about a relationship with him. It's about following him, about trusting him, knowing that when he's promised that everything is going to be okay, his promises will come to completion. Because when God says something, he doesn't just say something to hear himself talk. So often that's what we do. We give someone a promise or tell them that we'll do something, but we won't follow through. God continues to tell us, he says, listen, even though others may do this, that's not how I work. This is one of the reasons why, like when we take a look at the early stories of Abraham's life, before he became Abraham, when he was Abram, how in order to understand what was going to be, God divided the sacrifice into two. And normally for those times, the person that the covenant was about would walk through and they would be bound to the covenant. This was usually a person or a nation or whatever. So in this story, we should see Abram walking through these pieces of flesh. But that's not what we see. What we see instead is God turning and saying this. Instead of putting the covenant on you, and on someone that's going to break it, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something very different. 
we will walk through these pieces, we will bind the covenant to ourselves, knowing that you will break it. But in breaking it, you still are part of us because we've made you whole through what will be. This is a continual thing that God continues to remind us is that in having it all, you can think you have it all, but you have nothing. To truly have it all is having a lasting moment-by-moment -moment relationship with Him that no matter what happens, it continues to grow even through into eternity. We've got one more verse that I want us to t take a look at. Verse 21. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Literally, Jesus wrapping up this section saying, listen, there is a way that you can really mess your life up right now is by the very fact of God giving you so much, but you're not giving back to him. And remember, in giving back to him, this does not just mean within our tithes and offerings, which is very important that we're giving back month by month. But this is also giving to people that are in need. And we need to remember that the people that are in need are not just the people within our churches. They're not just the people within our families. These are the very people that too often are the ones that we hate the most. And we need to remember what Jesus has done for us and that he calls us to a ministry of reconciliation because his life isn't about us. It's about helping others know the true power and transformation, transformational grace that Jesus has given so that we're able to go forward and go home together. But he continues to say, hey, listen, you think you have it all, but you have nothing. Because without me, what you think you have is fool's gold. And fool's gold, when you go to the bank, it's not going to give you anything. Maybe give the banker a nice smile or a good chuckle, but you're not going to get any money out of it. What you will get, and you can go to the bank with this, is through a true relationship with me, you will have wealth unending because when it comes to our relationship, the wealth is not counted in currency. It's counted in experiences. So as we wrap up today, I want to leave you with this final thought. Like it was mentioned before, in having it all, we can think we have it all, we can look through everything we have, but that will never satisfy. To truly have it all means to be ready to give it up, to focus solely on Jesus, because he's the reason why we have what we do. Let's pray as we close. Father, that's, that's what we ask of you right now. That you would help us to realize that we don't have it all. That we can't do it all. Because it's only in you that we're able to go forward. Father, show us what you would have for us to do. Show us your faith. Show us your power. So that as we interact with people, as we tell others about you, that's all they see. They see you and they don't see us. Guide us as we head forward together, as we grow together, and as we continue to connect with you moment by moment. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus we pray. Now next week when we come back together, we'll be focusing on the fifth part in our series. Now if you remember, the series is called Principles, and principle number five is that of giving. So often when we talk about giving, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, make sure that you've given your tithe and given your offerings. 
every single month. And if you have a little bit more, give to the missions or do other things like that. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because that's the tone that we've been given from a very young age. But when God tells us to give, the way that we think that we're supposed to give is different than what he has to say. Now, in this next week, we'll be taking a look at what it truly means to give from what God has told us to do. As you go through this next week, may God continue to bless you, continue to guide you. Look forward to seeing you here yet again as we take a look at our fifth part in this series. God bless.